Today we're going to look at what I think is a really interesting sum. And that sum is, the sum is n goes from 1 to infinity of cosine of n over n. So this has a faint resemblance to the famous harmonic series which diverges. That would be if this cosine of n was replaced with the number 1. But this series in fact converges and we'll find its value. And we'll do that using some nice tricks moving in and out of complex numbers. So we'll start by recalling Euler's famous formula for the complex exponential that says e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. But then there's something called the real part function and the imaginary part function that, well, it does exactly what you think it does. It extracts the real part and the imaginary part. And so that means the cosine of theta can be rewritten as the real part of e to the i theta, whereas the sine of theta can be written as the imaginary part of that. And that's going to allow us to rewrite this in terms of the complex exponential. So let's do just that. So this will be equal to the real part of the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of e to the i times n over n. Okay, nice. But what does this look like? Well, this n in the denominator coupled with this n in the exponent looks like we've taken an integral or an antiderivative and had to divide by the multiplying constant, which is exactly what, well, like I said, it looks like it's going on here. So that motivates me to try to write this as an integral which has been evaluated. So I'm gonna introduce a variable here and that variable will be theta. And then I'm gonna evaluate this between two places. Well, it's gonna to have to be theta equals one at the top to re-achieve what we had before. And then we need it to achieve the value of zero at the lower bound of integration. But when is the exponential function equal to zero? Well, the answer to that is never, but it has a limit towards zero as the argument goes to minus infinity. And the way to achieve that is to put theta approaching i times infinity down here. Now if we naively plug i times infinity right here, we'll get e to the minus infinity, which is zero. Okay, nice. But now I'd like to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, which will take the derivative of this and change these bounds of evaluation to bounds of integration. But before I do that, I'm going to add or I'm going to include an i in the numerator and an i in the denominator. Because notice our exponent here is i times n times theta. So I'd really like an i times n there. That'll cancel out when we take this derivative. Okay, so now let's take this derivative and then include an integral. Okay, so we've got the real part of, now we have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. Now it'll be the integral from i times infinity up to one of i, which maybe I'll bring out here, times e to the i n theta d theta. Great. And now I'll bring the sum inside of the integral because if I do that, well, that looks like it might sum nicely. Okay, so that's gonna leave me with the real part of i times, now I have the integral from i times infinity up to one of the sum as n goes from one to infinity of, I'm gonna write this as e to the i theta all raised to the n power, then d theta. And I do that because now this term right here looks like a geometric series. And whenever you have a geometric series, you can find its sum if you know its starting term. Its starting term is usually denoted by a, which in this case is e to the i theta. That's because we're starting at n equals one. And you also need its common ratio, which in this case is also e to the i theta. And then let's recall that the geometric series will sum to a over one minus r. Okay, so let's see, that'll leave us with the real part of i times, now we have the integral from i times infinity up to one, summing this geometric series will give us e to the i theta over, 
let's see, one minus e to the i theta d theta. Then I'm gonna go ahead and bring this i inside here because it'll be like helpful for our next step which will be to do a u substitution on that integral to make it look a little nicer. Okay, so what might that u substitution be? Well, let's set u equal to the denominator, so one minus e to the i theta. But that makes du equal to, let's see, minus i times e to the i theta d theta, using the chain rule. But now peering into our integral, let's notice that this denominator here is exactly u, and then this numerator here isn't exactly du, but it's minus du. Okay, so bringing that down over here, we have the real part of minus the integral of du over u. Now we just have to sort out the bounds of integration. So if we have theta equal to i times infinity, well that'll be one minus e to the negative infinity, which is one minus zero, which is one. So that's our lower bound of integration is one. And then our upper bound of integration when theta is equal to one will be one minus e to the i. So we have one minus e to the i up here. But now that's a fairly simple integral to take. This will give us minus the real part because we can bring this minus sign outside of the real part of the natural log of u where we evaluate that from one to one minus e to the i. So in the end, we have minus the real part of the natural log of one minus e to the i. Now we just have to sort out what that is and let's do that now. So this is where we ended up on the last board. And I guess we're kind of done because we found, well, a number that this series sums to. But I think we can write this a little bit better. So let's take this thing which is in, so let's take this thing which is inside our real part function and let's set it equal to a complex number written in rectangular form. What I mean by that is we'll take the natural log of one minus e to the i, and we'll write it as a plus b times i. But that'll leave me with one minus e to the i equals e to the a plus b i. But now we can expand each of those to the left and to the right. So expanding this to the left will leave us with one minus the cosine of one minus i times the sine of one. Applying Euler's formula where theta is equal to one. And then expanding this out using exponent rules, we'll have e to the a times cosine of b plus i times sine of b. Okay. And then from there, we'll extract the real part of this equation as well as the imaginary part of this equation. But that's good because we've got two variables there, a and b, which we'd like to find, which means we need two equations. And we get two equations from this real and imaginary part trick. Okay, so the real part of this left-hand side is one minus the cosine of one. And then the real part of this right-hand side is e to the a times the cosine of b. Now the imaginary part of this left-hand side is minus the sine of one, whereas the imaginary part of that right-hand side is e to the a times sine of b. And now let's look at what we want. Since we're taking the real part of this natural log of one minus e to the i, we really want this term a here. Of course, if we found b, then we would find the companion to this sum where there was a sine in the numerator instead of a cosine. But let's focus on, well, just what we want in this video, which is the real part. So if we wanna find a, then that means we can destroy the dependence on b. And we can do that by squaring each of these equations and adding. So let's say that's exactly what we're going to do here. Square and add. So that'll leave us with e to the 2a times, well, it'll be cosine squared of b plus sine squared of b. So that's what we get from squaring these two and adding them. And then from squaring those two and adding them, we'll get the cosine squared of one plus the sine squared of one. 
And then the rest of this part expanding out will be minus two times cosine of one plus one. So something like that. But now let's see what we have. This term right here, this cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. This cosine squared plus sine squared is also equal to one. So that gives us e to the 2a is equal to, let's see, one plus one minus two cosine of one. So in other words, two minus two times the cosine of one. But now we can take the log of both sides and that leaves us with 2a is equal to the natural log of two minus two times the cosine of one. But of course we can just divide by two and then we have the value for a. But the value for a is not our final answer because we've got this minus sign out front. So actually negative a is our final answer. So putting that all together, we have minus one half and then the natural log of two minus two times the cosine of one. And then I think that's a nice final form for this sum. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.